I just want to refresh our memory on how Israel had treated God. If there was ever a reason, um, or if there was ever an example of pushing God to his limits and seeing, you know, what happens when I push God to the furthest possible, will he then turn on me? Um, we see that with Israel. Um, they provoked him time and again. Uh, there's the language, especially when you read the, the minor prophets, the major prophets. Um, it is strong language that God uses to describe how they treated him. Um, an example, Ezekiel 6, verse 9, the Lord says these words, I am broken with their whorish heart, which has departed from me. And, and, and that's just, that wasn't a little blip on Israel's radar. Like they, time and again, um, just failure. And, um, and so what I find so comforting is to know as we've reviewed that God does have a future for Israel, and, um, and it's despite the way they've treated him. And so you and I can also have such confidence um, that this God who has been merciful to Israel is a very merciful God. And when he is extending mercy to you and to me, um, you can have complete confidence that even I can be saved. Um, and so as we get in here, let me just get this full screen. Hopefully I didn't break anything. There we go. And so let's actually, uh, let's just read um, our passage here. Helps if I turn there too. I got distracted by the book of romance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Romans chapter 11, uh, starting in verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as you in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they may also obtain mercy. For God has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, as we open your word once again this morning, Father, we pray that your word would speak um, to each of our hearts, Father, that you by your Holy Spirit would impress upon us that which you would have us to take away today, here on uh, January 21st, 2024, each of us as individuals, um, recipients of your mercy, intended recipients of your mercy. You long, you are not willing that any should perish, Father, your heart is great. Your love is strong. Father, we pray that we would respond in the way that you would have each one here today to respond um, to your mercy. And so we give you thanks in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And so uh, here we conclude today three chapters of Paul's exclamation, really, of Israel's glorious future um, that's still to come. Um, and so as we um, look through here, we will see the conclusion of his comments to specifically regarding Israel, and then we're going to close with, um, with about four verses that I think are really setting the table for Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Um, 
it's like, well, we'll get there. So, um, so starting here in verse 25, um, we have um, Paul speaking, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of Gentiles has come in. And so there's this warning. Do not be wise in your own conceits, is how the King James says it. Others say um, opinion, I believe. So this idea of don't be wise in your own opinion. Um, this word is translated, um, this, that word conceit is actually often translated himself, themselves, yourself, through scripture. So it's interesting. It's, um, it's self. Do not be wise in self. And, um, and so... It's a warning, and one of several warnings, actually, that we see in this chapter of 11 um, towards the Jews and Gentiles alike, Paul is warning, um, do not be wise in your own opinion. And um, the idea that, self, that wisdom in self is never a good idea, especially if wisdom in God is available, right? And... Um, this is, I think, what Solomon in the Proverbs is warning against in those words that we know so well when he says, In all your ways acknowledge him or trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. There's a sense that we want to just trust in our own understanding and he is warning um, not to do that. And so the question is what, is, what exactly are we supposed to wise up to here? What is he warning us to, to not miss? And... Um, and he explains that it was something that was formerly a mystery, meaning something not uh, fully revealed, um, something previously hidden but now revealed. And that's specifically God's plans for Israel, I believe, that they are temporarily blinded. Um, and, and this is like we've talked about in past weeks, it's not a full blindness. It's not that there are no saved Jews today, but as you look at the nation of Israel at large, there is national blindness. You would not say that they are a God-fearing, um, Christ-glorifying nation. At large, they have rejected him. And, uh, but one day, that will change. And so, um, in, in, until that day, there's this other phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles that we see. And so, God's plans for Israel, they're temporarily blinded until the fullness of of the Gentiles comes in, meaning until the last Gentile believer is saved, I believe there is a veil at large over national Israel's reception and recognition of the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. And so some key words here we see, um, we've looked at some of them, but another word is blindness. And that's an interesting term that Paul uses here. It's a medical term. Uh, the Greek word was very closely to the idea of if a doctor was looking at a callus, he would say, well, that's like a hardening on your skin. It's, it's related to that word. It's a hardening like a callus. Um, and so when it's used in reference to the eyes, it's, it's called blindness or translated blindness. But if you think about it spiritually, this blindness was a hardening of the eyes. They were uh, like a hardening that they had seen much, God had given and shown much to them, given them many opportunities, and yet, despite all that they had seen of his glory, of his provision for them, after repeated hardening against him, it's like any other kind of what we know as physically, as you rub over time, that becomes rough and callous. And so that's the description of Israel as a nation today, largely calloused and insensitive toward God. But, what a beautiful word, until. Um, that word, uh, some have tried to translate that, um, so that, uh, but that's in order to translate this whole section as the church replacing Israel. But really, it has this idea of temporary in a distinct beginning and end. And um, the so that is not um, an accurate translation, as I believe. And so... Thank the Lord that this is a temporary blindness. And, and there's so many things that we don't really, we're not going to have time to get into. Uh, but earlier in the chapter, he talks about the fullness of the Gentiles. And then there's this idea that if the Gentiles 
if the fullness of the Gentiles is glorious, how much more glorious, I think we covered last week, is going to be um, the reception of Jews, of their Messiah. It's going to be incredible. And so one day um, this will change in that until uh, we'll end. The veil will be lifted. And so all nations of the earth um, being blessed through God's covenant with Abraham has a distinct start and end time in God's plans. And he only knows those times. At the end, God will then finish and complete his remaining promises to Israel. There are things that have been promised, land that they um, were promised in Gen Genesis that they still to this day have never fully um, received. But even more than that, um, the blessings of them receiving the Lord Jesus as their Messiah and being made clean is still unfulfilled. And so we should, um, the question then that this comes is, will lifting the blindness mean salvation to all Jews? Um, and that's really what we're going to look at in our next verse here. Because at quick glance, you might be troubled by this verse. It says, and so all Israel will be saved. That word saved means delivered, made whole, or rescued. And so the all I believe is in contrast to the remnant that we read in verse 5 of this chapter. Even so then at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Referring to Israel, there was a remnant of believers, but far from the nation at large receiving Jesus as their Messiah. And so during the present age, a remnant of Israel is saved through the gospel. And, so this, and that's why we would read earlier that this hardness or blinding is in part, um, when Christ returns, the situation will change. Instead of a remnant, instead of a small part, um, Israel as a whole will be saved. It will be a national deliverance. And um, so you might ask when, and I believe we have a clue of that as well. In the same verse, Paul says, he describes the return of Israel's Messiah, um, the deliverer. And so the return of Israel's Messiah referred to there as the del de deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So the return of Christ to establish his millennial kingdom, which we know comes at the end of the great tribulation. And there's many passages we could look at that talk about these things from a timing perspective and what they will look like. If you want to look at them, Zechariah 12 through 14 Ezekiel 20, Daniel 9, and even Matthew uh, chapter 24, verse 15 and 21, I believe, referred to this time. One of the verses, though, I do want to look at is this one on the screen. Zechariah 13, 8 and 9, And it shall come to pass, that in all the land, saith Jehovah, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part into the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, Jehovah is my God. A beautiful passage referring to a future event. Um, this has not yet happened, and so there will be a time when two parts, referring to the nation of Israel, shall be cut off and die, and a third shall be left. And so it's hard uh, to really quickly try to um, get into this, what it means by all Israel, but just in my opinion is that there is going to be uh, a time when two-thirds of, of the nation of Israel that has rejected God, they will be destroyed. And so the part that's remaining will be all Israel, and that will be um, a remnant as well that we see earlier in, I think, Romans chapter 9, where it says the remnant will be saved. And so... Before all Israel is saved, its unbelieving, ungodly members will be separated out uh, by God's uh, hand of judgment. And there's passages we could look at, Ezekiel 20, um, really Ezekiel 34 through 38, Daniel 12, Zechariah 13, like we just read. And so keep in mind that Paul has also just quoted Isaiah um, which is Isaiah 10 back in Romans 9, 27 and 28, which is the, the verse is, he will finish the work, cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth, 
As Isaiah said, before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been a Sodom and made like Gomorrah. And that's in reference, and I actually was supposed to read verse 27. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. So there is an, a time of judgment that will come, and the remnant remaining uh, will be delivered. And so um, further, Paul has already established what is a true Israelite is. He said earlier in chapter 9, not all Israel are of Israel. And then he also, um, we read in early, much earlier in Romans, I think it's Romans 2, where he refers to um, the true Jew is one who is circumcised, not just externally, but his circumcision is of the heart. And so these are the ones that will be saved. It's not that there will be those in heaven that are saved through faith in the Lord Jesus, and then others that are arbitrarily saved because they're Israelites. It will always be salvation through faith in Christ. And so um, we read here, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. And so Zion is a specific, it came up in our morning meeting. Um, it's a geographic area in the region in Jerusalem, frequently referred to throughout the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there is this idea of a heavenly or spiritual Zion that is also referenced in some places, referring to God's heavenly kingdom at times. But here I believe Paul is referring to the physical Zion um, that is prophesied um, of in Israel's future, many great events will occur from. We'll see in Isaiah chapter 2, chapter 4, 5, Zechariah 8, and 14, um, there are prophecies of the Messiah's rule on earth from a physical Zion. Psalm 14, verse 7 reads, O oh, that the salvation, or Yeshua, of Israel, O oh, that the salvation of Israel will come out of Zion when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. You can see the psalmist crying that the salvation, the Yeshua, um, closely related to the word Jesus, um, of Israel will come out of Zion. And so there are many prophecies in the Old Testament that Christ will do just that, um, that he will both come to Zion and out of Zion. Zechariah 14, Joel 3, Isaiah 59, uh, to name a few. And so Isaiah 59 is up here on the screen. The Redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you, and my words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. You're reading prophecy that has never been fulfilled. This is not true of Israel today, it is, but it will be true in a coming day. And so he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, we read. And then verse 27, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So the end of verse 26, he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And then verse 27, he will fulfill his covenant to Israel, taking away their sins. And again, uh, many we could look at, but here, these are just really neat to, um, to connect the Old Testament to the New, I believe, and to what Paul's referring to. Ezekiel 36, 22. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. So I'll pause there. Do you catch what he's, he's saying here? He is not saying that in a future day, Israel will be worthy of his mercy. Just like there was never a time in your and my life when we were worthy of the Lord offering us his salvation. Um, he is saying, though, for his name's sake, he has connected his name to the nation of Israel. He has made promises in God's name. Um, he cannot deny himself. And so for his holy name's sake, 
It says, that name which you have profaned among the nations, verse 23, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. What an incredible future Israel has to look forward to. Uh, and this is, I just love that no matter if we're, uh, you're an Israelite in Israel or a, a Gentile or even a, a, a Messianic Jew, one who is a Jew but has um, received the Lord Jesus as their Savior, we all have the same hope that God has, and the same certainty that God has made a way for us to be clean. He has, um, he has provided it through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus on the cross, cleansing. And here the nation of Israel has promised that I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. Isaiah, verse, uh, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2 to 4 reads, In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purge the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. I believe these are all connected. When we talked earlier, the two-thirds that would be destroyed, there is a spirit of judgment that is going to happen, but there is also a spirit of, um, of cleansing that will happen to the remnant of Israel to be saved. Matthew 1, 21, you shall call the angel's words to Mary and Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is the salvation of Israel, and thankfully, um, not only Israel's, but that of the whole world as well. God will fulfill the remaining unfulfilled promises to Israel, where he will place his spirit within them. He will put his law in their inward parts, even written on their hearts. Uh, we know that from Isaiah 59, Jeremiah 31. Um, wonderful things in, easy, in Israel's future. And so can Israel be certain of this? Uh, yes, uh, they can. Um, we see this here um, in our next verse, that God's promises are irrevocable. Um, so verse 28 and 29, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And so to the early church, the Jews were definitely their enemies, um, the unbelieving Jews. And so to the church today, one may conclude they are still enemies toward God. Um, as they have still at large rejected, um, not just the Messiah, um, but God the Father as well. And so we could see some examples of this even in the early church's days. Acts 14.2, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Um, Acts 18.6, but when they opposed him, being Paul, and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And so they were enemies to the early church, but, and even to God. And yet, it's inconsequential to God how they treat him. He will remain faithful to them. He says to them, you are, they are enemies to him, and yet, consider these here, but to God, they are beloved. We read in the breaking of bread this morning, I have loved you with an everlasting love. There is, no matter my heart's attitude towards the Lord, your heart's attitude, it does not change the nature of his love toward us. 
but to God they are beloved. They are precious. The Greek word here is pretty strong. It's almost, I think the context it was often used in was like of a um, parent's love towards an only child, not that they love that anymore, but it's almost like all of my affections have been doted on one person. And in a sense, that's like what Israel has experienced before the Lord all through the Old Testament. Um, when Even when we discuss that passage, Esau I have lo- um, uh, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, God is saying, I believe, that you know, I have been faithful to Jacob, to Jacob's line all of these years, all the way to the end of the Old Testament when he's quoting this. He's saying, I have been perfectly faithful to you. And um, despite them being no more worthy than Esau um, in terms of their general treatment of God. And so verse 29, God's gift and God's calling are irrevocable. The gifts, those are like the blessings we read of at the beginning of chapter 9. You know, Israel had the prophets, the, um, all of these um, privileges of being God's chosen people, blessings from him. Um, the calling, specifically, I believe, the invitation to receive the Lord Jesus as their Messiah, um, it's irrevocable. It's still extended to them. It will not be withdrawn uh, because God cannot deny himself. And so here in verse 30 and 31, For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. And so Paul is referring directly to the Jews in his midst and the Gentiles. And so he's saying specifically, To the Gentiles, you were once disobedient in God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. And we've covered that the last couple weeks, how um, Israel's rejection of the Lord Jesus led to the gospel going to the Gentiles. And even so, verse 31, those also have now been disobedient, referring to Jews, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. And so... Israel's rejection in subsequent hardening has opened the way for the Gentiles to mercifully be grafted in, like we've talked about in recent weeks. Disobedience, this Greek word indicates a willful unbelief on the heart of the Jews. It's knowing, the being shown the way, and willfully rejecting it. And so their disobedience led to the Gentiles, um, the gospel going to the Gentiles. But one day, the same mercy is going to be extended to the Jews as well. They will come to the one um, whom they pierced. And so, from this point on in our chapter, the the closing verses, I really think Paul is taking a step back now and and putting some concluding thoughts. As you can see, even in this verses, he's, he's driving to the point that essentially, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, that Paul was addressing in that day, We were all in the same boat. We have all been unworthy of God's mercy, of his kindness. The mercy has been extended to the Gentiles today, and one day the Jews at large will also receive his mercy. And so now he's, um, these concluding verses, I don't don't feel um, I could do them justice. If you think about what Paul is saying here, it's, um, it's almost like, he has been climbing a mountain, and then you, he gets to this place where he looks out over the view, and, and, and he just is moved to worship God and say, I can't understand, or there's no one that can explain what God has done, but it is something worth worshiping him for. Um, in verse 32, we read, For God has committed them all to disobedience, so that he might have mercy on all. And uh, there's a number of verses here that speak along these lines. Um, Romans 3, 9, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. You get the sense in these last few chapters that we've been looking at that there must have been something in that early church um, that Paul was addressing 
where there were maybe Gentile Christians thinking they were better than the Jews, um, possibly, that somehow they were more deserving or worthy of God's mercy, and that's why they were saved. Um, and that's not the case, as Paul, I believe, is, has made very clear here. And so we would do well, though, to take this to heart, because how do we make this practical and understand it for ourselves, um, not being a divided congregation, really, of Jews and Gentiles? But our struggle may not be Jew versus Gentile, but we can easily be guilty of having critical hearts or forgetting that we were never worthy of the mercy that we've been shown. And, um, and so when we see others, we can sometimes look at them with contempt and, and say they're wasting their life or they're doing this or that and they don't deserve God's mercy. Or um, we, ought, we ought to be careful what happens perhaps in the recesses of our minds. Just, um, just as you and I were hopelessly lost, um, there are others that are hopelessly lost and in need of his mercy. And we should never forget the mercy the Lord has shown us. Um, it is an unwarranted favor that we've been shown. And so there's others we could read here, but the point is, um, we'll go to the last one, Galatians 3.22, the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Um, God has done everything to prove that no man has a right to say, I deserve to be with you in eternity because of my efforts or my, my, my conduct towards you. We have all been shut up. We have no excuses. We are all guilty before God. And yet, the Lord brought us to this place so that we could um, understand that God is merciful to all, that we are all in need of it, and that, thank the Lord, he has shown mercy to all. And so it moves Paul really to worship here in verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And so it's like Paul's just, like I said, he's, he's climbed this, he's gotten to the summit of the mountain and he's just looking out and he's just filled it with awe at the view um, that the Spirit had, had shown him as he penned these words. And you can't help but explain, exclaim God's splendor. It's past finding out. It is unfathomable, literally not traceable. You can't logically trace um, God's act towards man. His, his behavior towards us can't really be traced. Um, we can't make sense of it. We can't follow his steps. Um, and so we shouldn't try. It's sad how many intellectuals at times have have really, I believe, have gone into an eternity separated from God because they just try to connect everything and prove to themselves why or how could this happen. Um, and yet, may we be like Paul and just moved to respond with worship at, and wonder at who God is and what he's done, to have a childlike reception to the gospel. In verse 34, he reads, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor. This is reference, I believe, to Isaiah 40, verse 13 to 14. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding, and who taught him in the path of justice, and taught him in, ju in knowledge, and informed him of the way of understanding? Rhetorical questions, nobody. God is self-existent. Nobody taught him what he knows. Nobody gave him um, anything that he has. Um, we could look at Job 38. Um, there's so much. Um, Job is such an incredible story, but you know in there how Job realizes uh, when God is asking him those questions, where were you when I did this, when I formed the, the world? And um, the, the reality is, you know, you were before me. And, and so it's almost like Every person needs to get to this place where they, um, I, don't, I don't know the reference, but scripture where it says, let God be God, or let God be true, and every man a liar. It's almost like I just have to get to a place where I can't figure everything out, um, and that's okay. God is God, and in comparison to him, I'm a liar. 
And, um, and so my ideas aren't going to lead um, very far. And so, verse 35, Or who has first given to him, that it might be paid back to him again? No one has ever made God obligated to them. Not a single man has ever made God obligated to him. No one has ever helped God out in a pinch. Um, what gift of ours would ever put the eternal, self-existent God in a position in which he were obligated to repay us? We couldn't. Who has ever given God something he didn't already have? There is nothing that we could give to God that he doesn't already have in abundance. And so consider the Lord's words to Job, Job 41, 11, Who has first given unto me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. The words of God. And so our closing verse, um, verse 36, For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I really think this is a... Um, an incredible lead into the next chapter, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 specifically. And Paul is saying, For from him, through him, to him are all things. So from him, Revelation 21, 6, He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. The Lord Jesus offers to you today, if you don't know him as your Savior, your salvation, every man's salvation, can only come from one source, and that's from God. It is from him. The fountain of the water of life is from the Lord. God is the chief originator of all things, but most spectacular of our salvation. Um, you and I must always remember, can a new heart come out of an old? Can, a, um, can spirit come out of flesh? No, if there is spiritual life in you, it has come to you from God. It is through him. Colossians 1.17 reads, He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Not only is God the source of life eternal, God is the means, the grace uh, to growing in him, through faith that we come to him. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus said. He is the means to eternal life. The, the means are a person, the Lord Jesus. Um, through him alone does this wonderful salvation come. And then lastly, all things are to him. And he concludes, to whom be glory forever. Amen. If all things are from him and all things are through him, we, I wish we had time to think more about to him. Is that automatic? Are you and I automatically to him? Um, do we live our lives like we exist for him? That's what this um, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, what a powerful words at the end. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. God is the chief end. All paths, every life will end in front of him. They are to him. Everyone will stand very literally before God and, and face him. And so the question is, um, will we approach him in his son, the Lord Jesus, or will we be standing alone before him, not clothed in garments of salvation, not sheltered, in the blood of his son. If you haven't made that decision in your life to be to God, to recognize I was created for him, what glorious liberty to realize this life isn't about my happiness, my satisfaction, because I've been pursuing that every day and it's gotten me nowhere. I have never been satisfied. I've never been happy. It's been elusive. It's always something else that's needed. Well, that's because we weren't created 
for our own happiness. We were created to exist for him, to bring him the glory that this God that Paul is worshiping here in these closing verses deserves. Um, God is the chief end. May each of us consider, um, especially as we go into next week, you see Paul begging, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. It's our reasonable act of worship. Um, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you um, for this incredible portion that has just reinforced and reminded us of, of Israel's wonderful future, that day when you will wash them, when many Jews, will, their eyes will be opened and they will realize Jesus is my Messiah. Father, we look forward um, to just continuing to see your plans unfold and Father, we pray that there, if there is anyone here today that doesn't know the taste of your mercy, that you would open their eyes, Father, that they would realize how wonderful and beautiful your Son is. You have concluded all under sin. May we agree with you and may we cling to you, um, knowing that it is your mercy, even as we'll look at next week, that enables us to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Lord, help us to be to you. Help us as a, individuals to be to you, that our heart would beat for you all through the week. Father, we pray as an assembly that we would be to you, that we would be a light, a glory, um, reflecting your glory, Lord, that we would have a heart's desire for many to turn to you, to know that there is salvation for them as well. Father, we pray that we would be toward you, to you. Uh, we thank you, Father. We, we give you thanks in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.